Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, Bronx Social Justice Matters Film Festival. And this is a live event and the live event is called Ask the Filmmakers. Um, and so not a surprise, we have four filmmakers with us today, filmmakers who are the filmmakers um, involved with these amazing films we've been screening um, over the last couple of days, um, moving screens around. Um, so this film festival is like a film in the way that um, you, a filmmaker can have a vision, but it takes a collaboration of many people to bring it to fruition. And that's what I would say about this film festival. Um, this is the first one. And so it took um, a village, so to speak, um, and if not a village, a small army. And so um, some of those people in the small army included Irene Delgado, who is the VP of Student Development, and Richard Ginsburg, who's the Assistant VP of Communications and Marketing, and Angela Wambu Gukab, who's the Assistant VP of Development, Luchi Martik, who's CIO, Luis Montenegro, Dean of Academic Affairs, Manny Lopez, Assistant Dean for Student Development, and Sammy Henry, web services manager. And last but not least is our provost, um, who I hope is here someplace, uh, Lester Sandres Rapolo, who, um, as I said in a recent interview, this is really his brainchild. And I, I really thank him for having the vision and the fortitude that it takes to make this happen. Though vision and fortitude are really key attributes of a filmmaker. Um, the, the festival would also like to thank our partners, which include both Lehman College and Hostos Community College, and of course, C City University of New York, which we are a part of, and our terrific sponsors, uh, which are Popular Bank and Bronx Pro, which is a um, women-owned business dedicated to community development. And so we give a shout out to them for their support. Um, I don't know, Lester, if you're on, I didn't see you, but if you are, would you like to make some welcoming comments? And he's not, so I will make it for him. Welcome. Um, so now uh, just a lay of the land, how the panel will be conducted. I'm going to introduce each of the filmmakers and then start off with my own one question. And uh, then we're going to be taking questions from the people who are here today. Um, and I'm sure you have a lot. Um, so you'll put your question in the chat. Um, Angela is here to convey the questions and uh, away we go. So the first filmmaker on the screen, I don't know where they are in your boxes, but the first one I'm gonna mention is Poppy Van Ord Granger, who is uh, coming all the way from Australia. Uh, so a real big shout out. She gets the award for um, most miles. And um, her film that um, is being shown is called Two Sands. And it's an exploration of a S South Sudanese young man on his first day of school in Australia. And his memories of his former life really are a very haunting reminder of the struggle of immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers worldwide. Um, someplace on your screen, you'll see Sebastian Rogers, Sebastian Wave. Um, he's the director of Love in a Time of Fear, which really focuses on four stories of people just like us here today. Um, people who are not stereotypes, not any one facet of their persona, but fully realized and nuanced people who for the first time are given a chance to speak. And last, but it's certainly not least, coming to us from Spain, this truly is an international film festival. Uh, we have Maria Lobo and Roy Gutien, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Roy, coming from us from Spain and they're, they directed Indebted to All Women a scathing and incisive look at El Salvador's punitive system of punishment for women who are undergoing abortions, even women who give birth to stillborn children or have a miscarriage. 
Um, even if these women have been raped and have become pregnant as a result of incest. So welcome to you all. Um, I'm gonna start off the questions with this one. These films and all the films in the festival cover a broad range of social justice issues. Uh, we're talking about homosexuality or immigration, marginalization, inequities in higher education, gender inequity, marginalization of the other, abortion. The list is really, really long. Um, so my question to you is, what was the most difficult challenge you had to overcome in making this film? And how did you do it? And how could some other filmmaker take what you learned and, and use it for their future? Who wants to jump in and start off? Roy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll I start off it. with what's what was the toughest thing? What was your toughest challenge for make in making this film? Uh, probably wanted to to avoid to make a portrait of this woman that made him appear as a victim. We didn't want to to show them as victims, even though they are victims of a of a uh, in, injustice, social or injustice. So I wanted to to show them uh, in a way that they are when I mean, they are protagonists and they were victims, but now they want to to get the right of their life and to and to overcome the situation. So probably for me, it's not like the was the, the biggest challenge to to show uh, what they become after this terrible situation that they suffered. And I'm trying to be very, you know, I don't know the word in English, but uh, victimizing even more with the, with the film. We wanted to treat them with respect. So that was the, the biggest challenge for, in my opinion. Sebastian? Uh, I, that's actually almost entirely my answer because my project started off, uh, you know, uh, just after, um, the Trump election, it was a collaboration between, um, we're a film nonprofit called Peripheral Vision PDX, and it was a collaboration between us and an author called Cassie Trentes. And we made these four 20 minute pieces about different people who were marginalized within, uh, you know, following that, 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 that election, like who, what communities were under the most pressure. Uh, and so we took, what we wanted to do is exactly what um, Roy was talking about, we know that relationship is the is the antithesis to to prejudice. Not not like trying to get sympathy or pity or trying to reduce people, as you say, to their issues or problems. All these things. So really, you know, years on, these four films have kind of served their purposes of trying to build relationship. You know, each film was one character. But I realized that now those four films, if I could make them into a shorter piece, just one 20 minute film, it would be more of a historical piece of what it was like for those folks at that time. But then the challenge was, well, the more you reduce the length of time the person has on screen to talk about themselves, the more you're forced to reduce them down to their issues. And that kind of is the problem with today's media because you know we're all we're always like trying to sound bite short and you know so that was the biggest challenge and i really couldn't face it alone so i actually involved a, a guy called uh, tony chris who's a, another author writer filmmaker and um and he helped me go through those 20 minutes and he wrote me a script of what how i could you know still show enough of who these folks were but it is a compromise because the 20 minute version with all four of them in definitely does do what Roy is afraid of doing which is you know I tried to show their them as solution which is the truth like marginalized people in our in our are the solution to the oppression of, of colonialism and empire and not not a problem within it so their perspectives are extremely important. So I try to keep their perspectives in there and not, not just reduce to like, oh, look at what they're having to struggle against and suffer. Because that's not the truth of who they are. And it, and it really isn't the truth. The, you know, when you go around the world and you visit, visit marginalized communities, the joy and peace and, and, and resilience that they show out 
classes, anything you'll see within dominant culture. So I, I 100% agree with Roy that that is the biggest challenge of filmmaking about these subjects generally. And I applaud the other filmmakers in, in knowing that as well. So thank you. Abby? Um, I feel like filmmaking is just one big challenge and that like you embrace that as a filmmaker. There's like millions of challenges all the time. Um, one of the first things that came to mind was um, casting. So Two Sands is scripted, but it's based on a true story. And um, Cook was 14 when I met him. He's 24 now. Um, and at that time when he was 14, there were a lot of young people coming from South Sudan um, as part of Australia's refugee program. But more recently, Australia is not accepting refugees from South Sudan. Um, and so we were looking and looking and looking for young boys about that age who, um, yeah, looked the part and also would understand where he was coming from. And we went to a lot of churches. So um, every weekend myself and David Kutcher, the um, producer, one of the producers, would go to churches and then in the lunch break when people were having a cup of tea, we'd grab all the young boys and say, all right, I want you to pretend that you're hiding in a hyena's house. Now pretend that you've seen a man with a gun. Now you're running. Um, and through that process we found Garang and he was just amazing. Um, yeah, and the, there's lots of little challenges like uh, the day before we were meant to shoot in this grasslands area, which was just this huge field with really high grass that looked a bit like South Sudan, the council decided to mow it. And so, uh, yeah, you know, things like that, fun challenges. So we, we had this little tiny patch of grass that we shot from every single angle possible. <laughs> so, so, and I appreciate all of those answers because I've experienced them and, and I'm sure filmmakers in this audience are, are nodding their head and, oh yeah, I, you know, I understand. But I wanna take a step back and talk about um, some other challenges, even, even before the challenges that you bring up. And that's the challenge of um, funding. Um, how, how difficult was it for you to, um, um, receive or find the funding for um, this film. And especially when you're dealing with sometimes controversial issues, you may run into uh, problems with funders who do not want to support it. So can you, if you can, you know, and, and if, you, if you have no problem with funding, I want to get your phone number, which I already have, but I want to, know, I want to go over to your house and uh, talk to you for hours. But um, if you can talk a little bit about that. What? <laughs> uh, we can say that really in, the, in this uh, issue of funding, um, our film was produced in a very different way to the usual one because our film is only one more tool, one more tool, sorry, in a two years project. I mean, uh, we work for an NGO. We are journalists and filmmakers in the NGO. And we, will, we work also in education. So we had a two years project uh, it was about uh, women's health and life. And one of the activities of the project was this film. It was, uh, we, they were needing the organizations there in El Salvador. They were asking for a tool for uh, political awareness. We want, we need this film. So it's true that um, maybe the funding was not, uh, wow, <laughs> so high, no, and that, you don't, you don't always have everything you need, but it's true that uh, that wasn't a problem in, in our case, because um, we work also hand by hand with all the organizations in El Salvador. It was something demanded by them. So we, we only need to, okay, let's put all our resources together. Let's put this film in a project that makes sense 
It's not, you know, an isolated production. It's uh, something that is part of a bigger, a bigger work. So for us, we discovered that um, maybe sometimes, at least here in Spain, if you try to make a film in, on your own, it's, uh, it's hard. I mean, it's very difficult. And um, sometimes it's very difficult to understand that uh, filmmaking and creating a film is something that takes a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of strength. I mean, it's not something that you arrive with your camera, then you took some editing program and hey, like in Instagram, it's not creating reels for Instagram. It's something that, but uh, I think we are lucky because in our NGO, we are all journalists and filmmaking, filmmakers. We know uh, how it takes, what it takes, sorry. so. We wrote, I think, our producer, Lorena, she's in, uh, in the documentary too. Uh, she found uh, the key to do it quietly. <laughs> yes, at the end, it was part of this cooperation project. Mm -hmm. So it was just a small part. There were also health, health programs, uh, education. education programs, and all these things. And this uh, documentary was part of this whole cooperation project. So, was oh, that, were, you, were you funded in a similar way? No, not in this one. Um, we got funding from the state um, film funding organisation. We got a very small amount of money. We got 30000 So that meant we could pay all the, the uh, crew and the actors, but all of the, like, the writer, director and producer, we all did it pretty much for free. Um, and yeah, I think it was really challenging. I've done other projects before that were better funded and it's much, it's much easier when, you know, people are not, um, trying to hold down their regular job and then do that on top or needing to give up their job to do this. Um, the other projects that I've worked on are probably similar to what Maria and Roy were talking about often, um, part of a bigger social justice agenda. And um, I get quite a lot of funding from federal and state arts money rather than film money, um, which, yeah, is great because it'll often cover not just the making of the thing, but also the social impact strategy and the marketing and distribution and evaluation and all of that. Um, yeah, I think sometimes when people start out, they just think about getting the money to make the movie, but really that's just a tiny little slice if you're trying to make an impact. Sebastian? Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> it's, it, it, I think probably in the audience, there's loads of people asking like, well, why are you not talking about the creative aspects of these films? Why are you asking about funding? Well, funding is the, the central social justice issue of filmmaking because when you have funding controlling the subject matter, which is how it exists right now. So sure, you can, as a, as a, as a white identifying filmmaker, you can seek grants and those sorts of things, but there's a privilege in that as well. And there's, and also then the grants are kind of deciding what is the subject matter. And then we get back to this idea of like reducing people to, to problems or social justice issues rather than their personhood. So, that's kind of why my organization exists for, for Vision PDX. So we have a, we, a tr our slogan is move the lens. And if you go to move the lens.com, you can become someone who does fund films. And I'm sorry to be so shameless and to just say that, but, but this is how this movie and other movies we make get funded. I found that if I have a story, I mean, my context is America. If I have a story that involves some sort of American victoriousness in it, even if there's struggle, it ha then I can get it funded. If it's a critique of culture, even people who consider themselves to be, you know, very woke and social justice minded, you know, they'd rather they'd rather be involved in giving that includes like the guilt offering, like you know, I want to give clean water to an African child, but I don't really want to give a camera to an inner city kid in the Bronx. It's not as sexy as a because it doesn't you know, ease the guilt offer. It's not as good as a guilt offering. So I think that, so this film was funded by the author who was writing the book. She gave money to help me make the film. We have these, we have donors who give like $10 a month or anything to, to keep us moving. Um, 
There's also another social justice issue involved because when you're talking about, well, everyone has to work for free to make a film, that actually puts the camera in the hands of people who have privilege because not everyone can give up their time to work for free. So yeah, funding is like, the central social justice issue, issue of filmmaking and whether it's done with good intention you know the there's a control of subject matter that comes through the grant system there's a control of subject matter that and a, an approach to filmmaking that goes through the situ the system of privilege like who can afford to spend their time filmmaking and then there's also a you know 98 percent of all charitable giving goes to organizations led by white people and i'm i I'm an organization led by a white person. And I'm going to tell you that's a massive problem because if every story of a marginalized person is told by dominant culture, then we are, we are shaping the lens in which through, pe through which people are seen. And therefore we have to be even more conscious to allow with the, with the questions we ask in interviews, with the way that we shape the narrative structure of a film, we have to be so conscious to make sure that we are not projecting as, as was said earlier, this idea of victimhood or reduction of a person's humanity down to the, the, them coming up against dominant culture. Like, who are they in relation to dominant culture rather than who are they in themselves and what do they have to, to share as far as wisdom and solution for the world? So, yeah, funding, big issue. I thought that, I think that's really uh, important points and, and, and pretty eloquent, Sebastian. We have a question from um, somebody in the audience, a faculty me member, uh, Dr. Seymour, who, who asked the question, with so many issues worthy of exploration for film, what advice would you offer to students who, who are seeking a cause to spotlight? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I just follow your heart. <laughs> and I know it sounds really cheesy, but um, that's how I work. Like something that you connect with. Yeah. Anyone else want to add something? I would say if you're going to be a filmmaker, you're a storyteller, then um, that's not the same. Like we all have like a propagandist inside us. But if I think if we pursue the cause that we want to highlight, then that propagandist is going to make our films kind of didactic and, and a little boring to watch or a little kind of like dividing or segregating of audience. Like if you agree, then you're going to watch it and go like, yeah, and then nothing gets changed. If you disagree, you're going to like switch it off immediately because you see that it's a cause based film. I think that pursuing subjects like stories, like, you know, like Poppy was saying, like it's the story of a real person's experience and the story, and my heart is to tell that real person's experience, not the cause that they represent, but the person who they are. And I think that not thinking of your film as being a cause, but, but maybe the cause of filmmaking in general being to, to tell stories that otherwise wouldn't be heard and then find the story or the subject that you're excited by and you want to share. So I'd say move cause back a little way and move personhood forward and, and experience forward. And I think that films can be, and then you'll know what film to make. I, I agree, but I think, that one, I, I think that one of the things that Poppy is saying, which I agree, agree with, is you, you have to have a connection to the issue. You have to, um, you know, I don't know whether love is the right word, but you have you want, a filmmaker has to care about the issue, whatever it is, um, because, you know, a thousand years ago, somebody once said, you know, when I was doing my doctorate, they said, oh, don't do it on that. You care too much. And I thought, gee, do I want to spend the next two years of my life on something that I don't care about? Or do I want to write about something um, and, and hopefully bring a journalist even as even as possible? I know media slant and all that. But I think that the story, I hear you, the story has to be first and foremost, but I would say to students, don't embark on something that an issue, and there's so many of them, which you don't care about because you're gonna be spending a lot of time and a lot of energy. Um, and also, I, I will also say that, uh, take your time to, to listen 
to the yeah. people. I mean, it's, it's, if you have one month, it's better to listen 29 days and film one day because otherwise you will, will be like saying your own story and it's not about your story. It's their it's, story. It's about listening and providing a, a, a tool or a camera or a story for, for them. At least is what, uh, how I see it. For example, in our case, we, we took, we had not too much time, just one month there and a previous travel, but we took like two weeks just listening, talking, agreeing with them what we were telling, if they wanted to, to tell this part, the other part, um, once the, the interview is and as we were, okay, this is what we want to tell, then we filmed. So for me, it's also a good advice for a student. Yeah, for a student and for someone who wants to work in social, social justice storytelling, maybe let's call it. Uh, for, for us, it's, we always say that we have a great responsibility. Um, what we show, what we tell, is very important because it's uh, like uh, it's, a, it's a window. It, it would be a tool to, to get nearer to a certain reality that maybe you never know before about it. So uh, you, you, you have a great power because even if you are young and you are, and you are starting and you are learning, you, are, you have a great power, but it takes also a great responsibility. So as Roy said and Sebastian also, I think that you need to take time, you need to listen, you need to, um, I don't know, it's, we, we always talk about bottom up stories. It, it's not the way I see a story, it's, we are going to build a story together. And um, for me, time and listening are very, very important skills in all the time. But when you are starting, the most. <laughs> it, it, Roy, it actually sounded like a proverb that could be listed in book. If you have 30 days, listen, 29. Um, uh, you know, I, I might have that embroidered and hang it over in my room. I think it's great. Um, we have another question. Uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to um, jump in. I think it, also, it depends on what kind of film you're making, like um, documentary versus scripted and how much of it is telling someone else's story and how much you're a collaborator in the story writing process. For Two Sands, it was based on a true story, but also largely fictional. So um, Cook and I wrote the story together and I um, had a lot of input based on my own experience as a migrant, teenage migrant coming to Australia. So yeah, that was really collaborative, whereas another project might be much more um, based in a documentary style where you're completely telling someone else's story and yeah, you know, all, all different types of methods. So we have um, a question from uh, Lucci who asks, and now that your film is completed, do you feel that it conveys the message you were intending to send? Did it capture your vision? Who wants to uh, weigh in on that? I'll jump in. Yeah, it, it's um, a great thing to do a screening and then hand out bits of paper afterwards and ask people to write feedback. We had ones with, yeah, what, what did you get out of it and what did you think it was about? And it was so exciting for Cook and I to read them and realise that people actually did completely get what we wanted. And especially because Two Sands is quite um, uh, poetic and abstract, we weren't sure how much we'd come across and yeah, it was awesome, really great feeling. And especially great to hear from other people who've also come to Australia from another country to feel that they could relate. And um, yeah, that's what we wanted. Sebastian, uh, Maria? In our case, um, I, I think we are happy about it. Mm -hmm because we wanted to, uh, you know, after people watching our film to react to this something. Yeah, maybe it's a small change, but really the uh, objective was, okay, we need international awareness, pressure to our government because this must uh, change. 
So we are happy because some months uh, later, after our filming, uh, one of the lawyers asked us about uh, some raw material and to use it. And now three of the women that you can see, they are in jail, they are free now. Uh, so, I mean, when when you receive that message, the okay, we need this shooting, okay, I will send you, I remember we were filming some place, in, I think it was in Greece or something, so, you know, you need to phone your office, look for this, send it to El Salvador, to El Salvador from uh, from Geneva, it was uh, just crazy, but now you, you see that they are at home, and Okay, it's useful. What we did is uh, it has an impact. And when we, you know, you, we receive uh, messages from women think here in Spain at least, when they say, okay, we, we need to keep fighting because our rights are not, we cannot take them for granted. When you, you see that uh, groups of women, of young women, they are changing, they are learning, they are moving, they are singing because uh, they are creating art. We, we feel happy about that because we think uh, that it really has an impact and it's not only our film, but uh, all the movement we are doing around this. Um, I think this is a very important, a key part as all the others, of course. That's an incredible story. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, I have no idea it's that I can't, I don't have anything tangible. So much of the time, I'm just trying to get people to ask different questions, um, not necessarily trying to offer a solution, but I hope that people watching the film will leave with a greater desire for a relationship. Maybe some of their preconceptions are challenged by hearing, because no one, like, so for instance, the young Muslim girl in my film, like no one in America often actually just sits eye to eye with, from dominant culture anyway, and even, you know, from other marginalized communities, sitting eye to eye and listening to the heart of a young Muslim girl is something that just they've never experienced before. And that, yeah, I just hope that it gives them a, you know, behind the scenes, like the amount of relationship I built with Samia, it transforms me and meeting her family and her father in the, in the longer cuts. Um, it, Love in a time of fear.com, you can see the 20 minute films of each person. Um, Bill had to, I built relationships to go in there, to go into her mosque and get those shots and to go into her, um, her family's home and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a hugely transformative process for me. And in the end, like I think that when God calls you into social justice work, it's really a transformation that he's trying to make in you. And I think if you center your, your your um thinking on like well what did i affect in the world um i think you're missing the journey of being an artist and a and a and a, just a person a creative person in the world like what has it done i can i can attest not to what it's done in the world but i can attest to what it's done in me and it's been a it was a it was an amazing project and i'm so super grateful for having that to do it Um, thank you. We have another question actually from Angela, uh, who, who asked a, a great question for, for all filmmakers, really, beginning and um, more advanced. How do you determine which film festivals you want to submit your films to? Um, you know, film festivals, we all know film festivals aren't, uh, submission isn't free. Uh, that would be a different world. Um, they're varying. Um, fees for them, some smaller or lower early bird, and then there's general and then there's late. So it is for a beginning filmmaker could be uh, rather costly um, if they were just going to submit to every film festival. And there are, there are literally thousands of film festivals at this point. So how did you determine, you know, what film festivals that you wanted to submit your film to? I want to answer that one. I started out really naive. Um, I did a project called Grandmother, which was the perspective of a Native American man of what it's like to live in a reservation. And I was so moved by the film and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. So I submitted to all the film festivals. You know, I spent, you know, like thousands of dollars. And I was like, I waited and I waited for the replies to come. 
And literally, we got into seven film festivals and all of them had the, the word indigenous or Native American or social justice in the title. And I realized that no one gives a sh about these films unless they specifically make a film festival that has a title like social justice matters, then, then save your money. Unless of course it's a narrative piece, which tells a kind of like a broader, a broader story, you know, then you've probably got more chance, but it, it, yeah, it's, you know, don't, I would say like, don't be naive. If you haven't made a film that addresses the, the interests and, and, um, and, uh, preferences of dominant culture don't expect dominant culture to be waiting excitedly to show your film in their film festival um and i think that's kind of part of the challenge like maybe I, like i'm making a film right now called high eagle about the first native american um rocket scientist to work at nasa but because it includes nasa american you know exceptionalism I'm sure that I can put that into many more film festivals because it's like, what, you know, we landed Man on the Moon, we beat the Russians, excellent, right? Where can we show this? Everywhere. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, you have to kind of dick in your skin and, and, and lose some of that naivety that, that dominant culture is not going to, to celebrate your film unless you address uh, things of interest to dominant culture. So you're looking for uh, social justice film festivals, film festivals that are specifically geared towards your your issue if that is how you're making films based on that so that might sound a little cynical but it's just a lived experience so. and poppy um roy um yeah i think exactly what sebastian said like um but for me i suppose it depends on what project because each project's got its own reason for being and thing that you want to achieve so um, sometimes, so at the moment I'm working on another project about a massacre that happened at a lake near where I live. Um, and one of the things that the elders that we're working with really want to achieve through that project is to have the local people living in this area know about what happened there and the local council to work with them um, more collaboratively. Uh, so, we're really going to be targeting local um, film festivals. It's a virtual reality film that we're making, um, but we'll also do some national or international things to kind of increase the profile of the film because that will also help us then build interest locally um, to get that change happening that we want. Um, but... Yeah, in a more general sense, I think someone gave me some good advice to if you are going to um, make a narrative and try and get it out in the world through film festival circuit, maybe pick a couple of the big fancy ones that cost 100 bucks to enter. Um, but, yeah, don't put all your money there. Um, just then look at targeting, like, stuff that's directly related to whatever you're talking about. Yeah. Roy, did you want to say something? Yes, uh, I, we agree, I think, with uh, Sebastian and Poppy, we did the same. I mean, we, we didn't have uh, our budget, we didn't, we didn't have budget for distribution, <laughs> zero, okay? <laughs> so we managed to get uh, some euros, some dollars, some money to, to pay, but we couldn't, I mean, the, the fees, we couldn't, just a small fees, okay? So we targeted to festivals with Keywords, social, uh, women's rights, human rights. So, because, we, I mean, our, our documentary is a very low budget documentary. You, know, you cannot compete in a big documentary or artistic or uh, whatever. So we just went to these kind of festivals. And also, apart from festivals, uh, we organized screenings in a very local, I mean, in our region, uh, together with community centers. So these screenings are together with debates. Uh, now we are two of the characters, two of the protagonists, two girls that are hip hoppers, MCs. They are coming to Galicia and they are doing a short tour in high schools, and uh, community centers. So we show the film. Then there is one of the persons that appears in the film and we arrange a debate. So it's a different way of screening or distribution, but um, in relation with the other answer, it makes an impact in mm -hmm. the place that we live. 
Right. So I, I would throw into this a uh, question that's not answerable. It's just my point of view is to question and to say to all filmmakers to question what the point of a film entering a film festival is at all. So if if the desire is to get um, a distribution deal, um, you may enter film festivals to get buzz to help your distribution deal. But if it's about making impact, um, we have to consider whether, you know, as Sebastian said, your money is being put in a, in the most appropriate way because film festivals are not necessarily going to uh, really give you the impact you want. You, you want to distribute in totally different newer models that call for partnerships with organizations that are related to um, really what you're doing and in that way get the message out. We have a question um, from, uh, from Richard Ginsburg, which really is a kind of personal question for this festival, which is what made you take the leap of faith to enter your film in this festival, being that it was our first year? And I think Roy kind of answered a little bit because we had social <laughs> justice matters. Yes, yeah. and I didn't know it was the first time. No. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I'm so but, hard. So we need to. Um, I, don't, I don't mind, meaning that it's the first time, okay, but it looks nice. You see, Brown Social Justice Matter Film Festival. Wow, Social Justice Matter Film Festival. Hey, you read but, the, uh, the you abstract read and you say, okay, so, matches. <laughs> okay. So, really, for me, that makes a difference that the festival runs for 20 years or for the first year. For me, it's more important the, the, the view of the festival or the, just the focus of the festival. Yeah, I have to say the same thing. It was, it was your name. Like, I think, like everyone, I enjoy success. My, my, um, my hit rate of getting accepted in festivals has gone up to almost 100% since I decided to only offer my films to festivals that care about the kind of films I make so uh, yeah I, I wasn't I wasn't doing you know and also there's this comfort for us because we're an organization we're making films constantly like and many films at the same time so a lot of the time our films will be kind of drawn into a um so for instance, we'll make a film about a mentoring organization and then that mentoring organization will be showing that film in order to promote their work. And we don't really have anything to do with that. Um, but a project like this is a little bit of a personal project because it's kind of like, I was putting together these films I made four years ago. And so for me, it's just more like a kind of like, oh, I just want to make a little push and see what happens. And, you know, when you get a tight, when you're doing a, a search and social justice matters comes up, I mean, you couldn't have named the festival any better for us social justice filmmakers. So I think that the, 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 it's not really a question of what we did, it's what you did. You, you knew your audience and you knew your subject matter and you communicated it clearly and boom. Great, thank you. Poppy, did you want to add something to that? Um, well, I didn't do our festival distribution. My wonderful friend Susie's been doing that for us and I imagine it was the same as what the other guy said. It was all about the title. Um, I think something that I personally get out of festivals like this is connecting with other filmmakers. It really helps keep that fire burning, you know. Um, yeah. Um, we have one more question, but I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, Poppy, what you said about connecting with other filmmakers, I wanted you to say what follow up on what Sebastian said. When people have asked me, I've said that one of the key, the best part of documentary filmmaking for me has been the people I've met and the relationships I've met. Um, it's certainly not um, an area to go into if you're looking to make money, that's for sure. But if you, it, it can't be be in terms of the people you meet and in the people that you develop relationships that go on for quite some time. So, um, you know, I'm following up on that. Um, we have two kind of specific questions that probably are more geared to narrative um, filmmaking. One is um, how do you choose your cast? And the other one is about locations. What makes a good filming location? 
Um, I think it's, you know, really more narrative based because in documentaries, you've got to go where that event is. But Poppy, maybe you want to start us off because you, you know, your film is a narrative film. Um, okay, so I'm not sure of my answer yet. Let me think it through. So the, the locations for that film, we had the school, the swimming pool, the grasslands um, and the house. Um, the school is actually the school that Cook went to um, in the Intensive English Centre. So that's where I met him when I was teaching there about eight years ago. And I've had an ongoing relationship with them. So um, I think actually if Cook and I didn't have that with that school, this film would have been impossible because there's an, no school's going to let a bunch of filmmakers come in and interrupt their school day. And Aramal is just amazing. They... Um, all of their drama students are the extras in the film. Um, and yeah, it's, it was really special for us to film there. Um, I, yeah, what, what, what was the other part of the question? What do you look for in locations? And so one was about locations and the other one, it was about casting. Um, how do you choose your cast? Oh uh, yeah, um, that's really fun. That's like the magic of, human chemistry and just it's quite scary because you don't know you only audition someone sometimes for half an hour or an hour um but yeah I think you just wait for that little bit of magic I did all my auditions on um my mobile phone because it was just run and gun stuff um when we found Tyro who is the um support character the kind of friend that Garang makes. Uh, we actually auditioned heaps of other boys and we got them to come and hang out with Garang and we just waited to see who had chemistry with him and then afterwards said, all right, Garang, who did you like best? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoy the casting process. Just waiting for that little bit of magic to happen. Sebastian or Maria or Roy do? I would say I disagree entirely with the premise that, that casting and location is, is, an, is an issue purely for narrative filmmakers. It, it kind of, in it hold, there's a mythology that, that in some way documenta documentary is about, is, is the truth rather than a very, very, very selected slice of the truth. And I'm sure that um, Roy and Maria will agree with this. You, you, the, the characters like, I wanted to make a film about the, the issues that people were facing in the new Trump administration. So I'm thinking LGBTQ, um, I'm thinking a young black man, I'm thinking about a, a, a Muslim person, but there's hundreds of thousands of Muslim people. So my casting process is like, who is my character in this film? It's just exactly the same as choosing an actor like this person. And then as far as location goes, so the B-roll over Hakeem's story, since he's a young black man, um, but where do I go and choose to film him in his everyday life? Like, you know, where do I shoot his interview? Is it, um, you know, in a, a, a kind of studio? You know, I went to the community center with him because I knew he grew up. I know more about his story than the, the audience will ever know. And my B-roll and how I film him in his daily life is a selection of that, that that tells the story of his life. So I chose the location of the community center, which I knew he grew up, grew up kind of mentoring kids in. I chose the church that he preaches at because that's another aspect of his character, not discussed at all in the film, but he is actually a preacher. Like I chose, you know, we're, we're constantly selecting character, we're constantly selecting location, and we're constantly selecting from the vast sphere of truth. It's, it's actually more similar to narrative filmmaking, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, than it is um, with what, how people imagine a documentary is made. Um, it's a creative process, and you have to cast, and you have to locate. Sure, I, I agree absolutely with you. I mean, you, you need to... You want to tell a story, you want to tell a story in an effective way. If you think it sounds not good, but at the end you want to create an impact and you know that uh, with this character, the impact is bigger or it's... Well, um, at least you always, want to, you always want to move some emotions in the audience. I mean, it's, it's what we do. <laughs> For example, in our case, when we shoot the trial, uh, we, we wanted this image. We were, even if it was 
de, ¿cómo se dice los juzgados? De uh, the court. The court. When we went yes. to court. Uh, we wanted to go there, we wanted this image to appear because it shows a lot about uh, their travel when they pass from being in detention, then the trial, and then, but in other cases, for example, we couldn't decide. For example, when we filmed the, uh, the woman in, one, one woman, one character in Fungar, a documentary, uh, she lives in a neighborhood that is controlled by gangs, by Maras. So, well, we have to, to deal with the gang to arrange an appointment somehow. <laughs> There you cannot um, decide any, anything. I mean, you go to the place where they tell you to go, the time they tell you to go, and you leave when they tell you to leave. I could, mean, you cannot choose <laughs> anything at all. We could film because we were working with the health, uh, health community woman, so she also helps the gangs when there are shootings. So <laughs> we have this, this woman there, but we have to film in one place and we cannot move out of this house. So we have both situations. Uh, we, we could decide, we decide the cast and the, and the location, and it's not possible, but still, it helps to, to tell your story, uh, you the understand and just film it. <laughs> I think locations, they act like a character too. I think that Sebastian, I agree with him, is, is uh, sometimes they are, in our case, they were uh, one more character in the film. The court, the jail, the hospital, even those houses, because we have interviews of women in houses And, and you cannot know where they are because they are protected. So at, at that moment there, you but cannot- that's why, but, that's, but that's why I'm saying there are certain, I, I think that there, there are certain things that are, are given. There are yeah. certain choices yeah. that are made, but exactly the point that I'm making, if you're told to be in this place at this time to get this shot, and you're going to have to leave after that, that's that location. That's a look. That's the location that, for whatever yeah. reasons surrounding it, you need. Now it's true. You're going to decide whether after you shoot it or before whether you want to abide by that or that's a location that's important to your story or not. But uh, you know, um, when you're doing a narrative film, I think that you can um, have more flexibility than you can if somebody's deciding for you. I need you to shoot between this and this time. I had that similar thing. I was shooting in a detention center for uh, in Newark um, and I wanted to show the detention center and, and you know, I went through, uh, I don't want to say going back 14 times. Um, and there are choices I could have made, certainly. I could have done it through animation. I could have maybe um, created the location. But, you know, I, I certainly wanted to be as uh, um, close to showing the circumstances as possible. We have only a couple of minutes left, so I want to make sure that I have each of the filmmakers um, say their, um, you know, their last takeaway that they're imparting to new and not so new filmmakers as we move on. And then I want to make sure that we have the provost who is on now, Dr. Uh, Lester Sandres Rapolo. Um, he, he, he's not, he wasn't here for the introduction, but due to another meeting, but he's here for the conclusion. So I'd like him to end it with the last words. But first, before uh, Lester, can each one of you kind of throw out to a, a filmmaker, a beginning filmmaker, a more seasoned, um, you know, some of your pearl, one pearl of your wisdom, one of you, one of the pearls. What should, it, what should a new filmmaker at least keep in mind all the time? I'd say don't listen to any narrative you might yourself or other people might be telling you about the barriers to entry in filmmaking. I, I, I remember shooting my first documentary film on a $400 Canon I borrowed from a, a church and you know it was like grainy and, and we, when, when it was eventually shown in a movie theater, I expected to be humiliated Um, but actually it came across just great. There's like a, just like a vinyl record has a character 
that a CD doesn't have. The idea that you have to have like a you know twenty thousand dollar cinema camera to move people is just not true. So whether you've got an iPhone and you've got your you know I learned to edit film off YouTube. There is no real barrier to starting, and if you're in that oh if I will when I then you won't. And the difference between you know people who make films and people who don't is just purely that they're people who make films compared to people who don't. I would say just start filming. I mean, yeah. choose one story near from your house, something that you know, and start filming. Start for something short. Don't don't try to make the the big the one hour half movie that goes to the Oscars and the best documentary. Just think one story that you like to film and shoot it. I mean, do, do it yeah. and let's see what happens. Go filming. <laughs> Happy? Um, I think for me, like, teams is really important. So trying to find people that you love working with um, and, yeah, stick with them. Uh, like, yes, you can make a film on your own and some people might thrive in that space, but personally I find it much more fun to work with other people. So, yeah, try find some people that you like. <laughs> Gee, Poppy, you did what I love, which is that I started uh, this uh, panel talking about collaboration and collaboration of all the people uh, that made this film festival possible. And you brought it back to collaboration at the end. I just love that. Um, and speaking of collaboration, we have now um, our provost, Dr. Rapolo, um, who is going to share some of his pearls of wisdom, perhaps, to filmmakers or not or share something else as we close. Thank you so much, Dr. Deborah Goncha, and thank you so much to all the uh, wonderful uh, filmmakers that are here today with us. Uh, you are the future, you are the present, and your work, your dedication, uh, your wisdom um, is, is second to none. We, we need advocates, we need folks like you that through art, can make a difference. And our students, uh, not only in, in New York City in the Bronx, um, but also uh, around the world, uh, see you as a role model and, and you are a role model um, for them. And you are a role model for uh, for me, for sure, because I learned a lot watching your films, your entries. And I, on behalf of the entire CUNY family, uh, more than 500,000 students that we have, and I'm sure that our chancellor, Dr. Felix Matos Rodriguez, and our president uh, from Bronx Community College, Dr. Uh, Thomas Sekenek Big and Lehman, uh, the president of Lehman and the president of Hostos, will also echo my, my words. Uh, change, as we all know, uh, will not come if we wait for someone to do it. We have to do it. And Sebastian, Maria, and Poppy, you uh, you did it and you have done it through your films and you will continue to do so because it's your, it's your calling in life. And, and, and uh, I'm sure that you will continue to inspire many future generations. You did inspire me. And um, adelante, as we say in Spanish, keep moving forward. Uh, uh, and thank you for choosing... Uh, the, the Social Justice Film Matter Festival, uh, and we are so honored and, and happy and delightful to have you uh, as part of the, the, the first uh, group of filmmakers, and I'm sure that we will continue moving forward. And I will be remiss to say thank you, Dr. Deborah Goncha, for, for your work, Angela, and all the team at both institutions, um, BCC, Lehman, and Hostos, that help us to make this happen. And, and all the team that has uh, helped us that you don't see in here in camera, but they were very uh, instrumental to make sure that this happens today. So uh, thank you very much. It has been an honor and a pleasure. And I hope this is not the first time and we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Again, thank you.